Forum for Public Advocate, hosted by the Center for Community and Ethnic Media here at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. I am Errol Lewis, an adjunct professor of urban reporting here at the J School. I'm also the political anchor at Spectrum News New York One, and the host of You Decide, a new podcast, an exciting new podcast available wherever you get podcasts. Um, the Center for Community and Ethnic Media is an initiative of the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY that provides training, resources, and advocacy for the community and ethnic media sector, uh, which in turn gives voice to a wide array of New York communities. <clears throat> you can find out more about the center online at ccem.journalism.cuny.edu. The co-directors of the center are here. Jahangir Kadik is a... Uh, running around making things happen. Karen Pranar is here as well. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's forum for Public Advocate. I'm gonna start by discussing some of the powers of the office and why it is vacant. And then we're gonna hear from some of the leading candidates that you asked for. Uh, there are 17 candidates running. We asked you who were the top four that you'd like to hear from. You gave us the list and uh, here they are, or three here. Or I should say, three here and one on the way. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the powers of the office. You'll hear from the candidates. I have a few questions to ask them. And along the way, uh, you'll uh, be able to ask questions as well. We'll be distributing cards. Jahangir has them for you. You can jot down uh, what you'd like us to discuss. Uh, the powers of the office. This is an office formerly known as the city council president that was the uh, ancestor of this office as of 1993 though it's been called the public advocate after the 1993 reorganization of government it has a combination of powers the most important of which is the uh, succession power if something should happen to the mayor if the mayor should uh, resign or depart or have an accident of some kind the public advocate steps in and temporarily serves as the mayor. One very important power. Another important power is to preside over meetings of the city council, which is not so much about directing the legislation so much as running the session, but the public advocate is also an ex officio member, an official member of every city council committee with the power to introduce legislation. So the public advocate also gets to help direct uh, where the laws go, what laws get passed, what laws get debated and introduced down at the city council. And then finally, the office serves an ombudsman role, it's a sort of a fancy way of saying constituent services for the whole city, meaning we know folks need help in a lot of different ways. They can go to a lot of different agencies. They can go to their local elected officials. And if they don't feel they're getting the level of help that they need, they can also turn to the public advocate, which has a, a staff to help do that. Um, it's a, a, a batch of powers that are not really commonly understood. And each public advocate that we've had has interpreted the office in their own way and used more or less of those powers. Some have really leaned on uh, the ombudsman role and done a lot in that area. Mark Green, for example, uh, pushed for and helped implement the 311 system, whereby you can call and get a lot of non-emergency information. Um, there are others who have gone the advocacy and litigation route. Letitia James, the most recent public advocate, often sued to, to get her way or threaten to sue and uh, publish things like the worst landlords list. So that was how she interpreted the office. Um, the vacancy uh, that we have in this position is because Letitia James ran for and was elected as uh, the state attorney general. And so there's gonna be a special election on February 26th, right around the corner. Uh, and there are 17 candidates running we did not have uh, room or time or frankly inclination to try <laughs> and have a forum with 17 candidates. So we asked uh, the CCM members who you wanted to hear from and the answers are before you as follows. Um, from my immediate left, we're gonna hear from Melissa Mark Viverito, former speaker of the New York City Council who represented a district in East Harlem. 
and the South Bronx. This is true. Um, uh, next to her is Idanis Rodriguez, a council member from Washington Heights and Inwood, and probably some other neighborhoods I'm forgetting, but those are the two I think of. Ah, yes, Marble Hill. Um, uh, Rafael Espinal represents parts of, uh, knowing your district, I'd say East New York, Ocean Hill, Brownsville, and probably a piece of Bushwick. Bushwick. Yeah, 60% 60 of, of it is Bushwick, okay. So we've got uh, one former council member and former speaker, two current council members uh, on, on his way I hope, is uh, Assemblyman Michael Blake, who you also asked for. But let's, let's get started. And unlike last night's 10-member um, sort of uh, steel cage match, uh, we, we have uh, time for a different kind of conversation. And I'll invite you, in order, uh, to take about five minutes to explain who you are, why you're running, what powers of the office you plan to make the most use of, how you interpret the, uh, the combination of powers that this office holds. <coughs> Well, good afternoon. Buenas tardes, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I've, I've come here many times, and I support very strongly the work uh, that this center does, and, and so thank you all for the community ethnic media that is here. You know, look, I, you know, the, the, the position of public advocate is a watchdog, right? It's a check on the mayor, check on city agencies, making sure that government is serving New Yorkers. The relationship that the public advocate has um, with the constituents of the city is important, right? That's the relationship. It's not, you know, having to go and lead a legislative body. It's more. So I see the position as being a very strong position in terms of what you mentioned, being aggressive about introducing legislation. Uh, I've talked about dividing the office into having a division of research and investigation to be able to partner with institutions like CUNY or other academic institutions or think tanks to aggressively research, right? Areas where government is not serving effectively, where there are concerns that there's disparity in treatment by city services, really aggressively investigating and set, giving a set of recommendations on how government can better serve New Yorkers. I've also talked about creating a division of community engagement, where we would hire community organizers that look like, right, and speak uh, languages that are the majority here in the city of New York, and being out there in the communities and helping here, I'll put ear to the ground on what it is um, that we are hearing, what are the concerns New Yorkers have, and having that direct some of the work of the Office of, of Public Advocate. And the last one is a uh, Office of Legal Aid, right? A division of legal aid where you would partner with law firms and look aggressively at where are areas of possible litigation and making sure that there's a, you know, a, a, and make sure that we're doing that. So I, I do believe in that power in terms of, of the ability of the public advocate. Um, so, you know, my background is, is very clear. I am an activist, a lifelong community activist with a track record of success fighting for greater equity and justice in the city of New York as council member and speaker. That's the vision, right? And that's the way that I will pursue this role to be your voice uh, and to make sure that the constituencies across the city are clear that I'm having a direct dialogue. I mean, I, I know you're not past. Let me just say the importance of all of you in this room, community and ethnic media. Um, I respect that greatly. When I became speaker, I created a division, I'm not sure it's there now, of really specifically having staff that is interacting daily, making government respond to the constituencies of New York City. Not everybody in the city of New York gets their media or gets their information through mainstream media, right? The role of community ethnic media is critical for government to be truly responsive. So I have actually on my campaign up a, a staffer that is solely and only dedicated to interacting with community ethnic media, making sure that we're aggressively making ourselves accessible. That is what is government's role. How do we serve you? How do we best serve you? And so having that line of communication directly with our diverse constituencies is critical and you're all vital in that. So I thank you for your work and, uh, and that's laying out a little bit of the vision that I had for the role. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. And I want to first share a little bit about me, second, my experience, and third, the role of the public advocate that I would do when I get elected with the support of New Yorkers. Mi nombre es Idani Rodriguez, nacido y criado en República Dominicana, un país de América Latina, un lavaplato, un taxista, un trabajador de factoría que vino aquí a proveer mano de obra barata, pero que con la bendición de Dios me dio la oportunidad 
de tener la experiencia necesaria para ser la voz de los que no tienen voces. My name is Idani Rodriguez. This is like a dream come true as a dream of any, of any immigrant. I was born and raised in the island of the Caribbean from where Juan Rodriguez, the first non-Native American, Native American came and settled here in 1613. So when I was born and raised in the island, back there, I fought against the United States invasion. I remember George Bush senior visiting there, Latin American organizing protests because the invasion and how the United States was trying to put government uh, from Duarte's in El Salvador and all the past president dictatorship in Latin America and the whole world. So I got my fingerprints back in the island fighting for education. When I got here in 1983, I just came here to wash dishes at Old Henry restaurant, West 4 and 6th Avenue. Now there's a capital bank. So when I pass by, I take my two daughters. This is where your father came to work. Then I was a liberal taxi driver, and that's why I stand for the yellow taxi drivers who they've been losing the value of the medallion, the liberal taxi drivers, because I lived that experience. I came here to work in a factory when hardworking people, they were the one maintaining our economy. Then I was the organizer at CUNY, 1989-1991. I fought, I led the movement when we took covers and we organized and we won over Mario Cuomo not to increase tuition and cut the budget. After coming back from my last semester in China, in Fudan University, I graduated in 93, and I got my degree in political science, my master's degree in political education, became a co-founder of school, teacher for 13 years, and then a council member for the last 10 years. I know what it is to spend 40 years fighting for social justice. I know what it is to be an effective legislator. I know what it is never to forget where I'm coming from. Now, the city need a public advocate that I speak for all New Yorkers, but especially for those 38% New Yorkers born and raised in another country. It is great to have compassion, but it's a different story when you are discriminated because of your accent, even by the media. And I believe that I'm here today, standing in front of everyone who cares for our city. The city is not ready for the changes that we're going through right now. As a public advocate, I will be the voice of the voiceless. The public advocate responsibility is to be sure that all city agencies give their services and respect to all New Yorkers. The, the, the public advocate is, is the person who leads the city council. The public advocate also is sit in the advisory board and make decisions on how advise the city how to invest $200 billion. So, and lastly, if the mayor cannot hold his position, the public advocate is responsible to maintain the office. I'm ready for that opportunity. I'm ready for that experience and the support of New Yorkers. I'm pretty sure that I will be the next New York City public advocate. Okay, thank you very much. Councilman. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Yo también hablo español, pero lo voy a tener en inglés porque <laughs> eh, para hacerlo más fácil. Eh, yo, yo soy, uh, my name is Rafael Espinal, and I'm a born and raised New Yorker. Uh, I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn, uh, one of the most disinvested neighborhoods uh, that this city had to offer. But it was also a community that gave opportunities uh, to immigrant families like my, like my parents who came from the Dominican Republic uh, were able to uh, buy a home thanks to their union jobs, raise six children, uh, and really provide security in a community that wasn't secure. Um, I, I ran for office at the age of 26, 27, uh, because uh, I was uh, fed up with the fact that city and state government uh, were ignoring communities like mine. Uh, why, did we why did we have the highest unemployment rates? Why did we have the higher rates of crime? Uh, why did we have uh, the most failing schools in the city? And those are questions that I felt that needed to be answered, because I believe that every neighborhood uh, should have equal access uh, to all of the resources the city has to offer. There's no reason uh, why my community should look any different than, let's say, Park Slope did. Uh, so I, I ran with a, with a vision of making sure we, we, we I was fight, tackling you know social and economic issues, uh, and I've recently grown a passion around uh, climate climate injustice, especially in communities of color, uh, because of the high asthma rates and all of the other health issues that we that we see that happen uh, because of where they decided to place, for example, waste transfer stations in the past. Um, so I'm running for public advocate because I think it's time that we have a, a fresh new voice 
uh, that's able to uh, take on issues in, in, with a different approach. Uh, I've shown in the city council that I, I have been creative uh, with, with, with the legislation I put forward. Uh, for example, I repealed the No Dancing Cabaret Law, a law that has affected uh, African American communities, Caribbean communities for a very long time because it was being used to over enforce on, on the establishments. Uh, I also, uh, of course, under the leadership of Melissa Mark Rarito, uh, introduced the, the, the law, the bill that made New York City a sanctuary city uh, so that the city and state agencies wouldn't so that city agencies wouldn't be able to interact uh, with 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 ice um, I also um, you know pa passed a bill for example that uh, required all restrooms across the city to have diaper changing stations because I wanted to tackle gender parity and make sure that you know uh, men and women had access to diaper changing stations uh, and I think that you know having someone that can think outside the box and really think about the issues that government is not talking about is all we need in the public advocacy uh, how do we have someone uh, that's going to think about the, issue, the issues our city is facing now. I, well, what I see today is that all of those pressures that my community saw when it comes to um, the cost of not being able to afford the cost of living, uh, we're seeing across the city because right now, in order to live a comfortable life in the city of New York, you have to make $125,000 a year. And we know there's a lot of families who, who do not meet, the, meet that threshold. Uh, as public advocate, I have, uh, I believe, a six-point plan uh, that looks to make New York City a lot more livable for everyone. One, how do we uh, make sure that New York City is, is being a leader on the fight against climate change? Uh, I have a bill right now in the city council that require every single rooftop in the city to go green, uh, which means cleaner air, cleaner water, uh, improving our city's infrastructure. How do we uh, uh, pass a moratorium so that they can stop destroying and bulldozing community gardens, gardens that are, are vital community spaces, especially in, in communities of color? Uh, how do we uh, fight plastic pollution? You know, I think that we should follow the EU and make sure that we're getting rid of all single-use plastics in our city. Uh, I think that you know we have we do know we have an affordability crisis. As public advocate, I will travel up to Albany and advocate for universal rent control, making sure that we're that everyone who has an apartment in the city is protected. Um I'll also, you know, looking at um, uh, you know this other bill that I have that uh, allows for workers to disconnect from work after hours. I think it's an important conversation. There are people who are being exploited. Uh, we're working harder, and we're not being compensated for it. Uh, as public advocate, I want to be able to use that position to talk on a citywide scale uh, about that issue. Uh, and you know, so I, I really see the powers of, legis of le being able to legislate as as one of the most attractive uh, points of the job, and that's that's what I hope to do as the next public advocate. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Our um, fourth candidate, your fourth candidate that you requested, is uh, Michael Blake. He's a member of the State Assembly. His uh, district in the Bronx includes all or part of uh, Concourse Village, uh, Tremont's in that district, I know Charlotte Gardens is in that district, and probably a couple of other neighborhoods as well. Michael Blake, we're asking each candidate to spend no more than five minutes explaining who you are, what you hope to do with the office. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Blake, and thank you for having us today. And in Arrow, of course, great job last night at the debate. Uh, I represent the South Bronx from 153rd to 183rd in the 79th District. Uh, I come to you as a son of immigrants. My father uh, passed away in 2013. He was a janitor at St. Barnabas Hospital. He was a member of 1199 SEIU. My mother worked at a factory for 40 years. Uh, retired after raising four boys, beat breast cancer, uh, and gave us the opportunity to be able to be here. I went to public schools K through 12, uh, PS 79, 118, and Dewitt Clinton High School. Uh, and went to Northwestern University 2001, fell asleep at the wheel. If it wasn't for the luggage in the car, I would have gone over the cliff that day. Wrote out something to myself a week before that that said, Dear God, may today be my greatest day, greater than the great day I had a day before, but my goal has not been met unless tomorrow is the greatest of them all. Had the opportunity to work for President Obama. I worked for him for six and a half years, worked on both campaigns, including at the White House, where I oversaw minority women business outreach and county and state elected outreach over two and a half years at the White House. But I came back home because I wanted to take care of my father before he passed. I wanted to help my community. And after that, was elected to the State Assembly in 2014. We've been able to work on concrete things to help New Yorkers. And if you see on our website, blakefranyc.com, you'll be able to see the vision we're trying to create. First. We were able to change the law so that minority women-owned businesses that contract with New York State get paid in 15 days instead of 30 days to help make sure people get more money in their pocket. We changed the law for raise the age so that 16 and 17-year-olds are not tried as adults any longer in criminal court because Khalif Brada was our constituent. We wanted to provide that justice. 
we focused on the My Brother's Keeper program, where we're still the only state in the country that has a program dedicated to boys and young men of color, $56 million dedicated to that. And focusing heavily on NYCHA, where we were able to have $250 million get dedicated on last year, particularly for security cameras and doors and locks and heat and hot water. I'm running for public advocate under the party name of For the People, and I'll be the second name on the ballot. And the vision what we have is called Jobs and Justice, because at the end of the day, I believe that's how we have to help people be able to move forward and how do we help New Yorkers. I believe the public advocate should have a permanent seat on the MTA board, because the trains and buses need to run on time, and to create those opportunities to make sure, whether it be on access, whether it be making sure that you have working elevators, when only 25% of elevators are actually working at train stations and have access in that manner, but equally making sure that we're focusing on the signals and also congestion. We're grateful that the endorsement of former Lieutenant Governor Dick Ravitch, who ran the MTA to support our campaign. On housing, we have a three-part vision. First, when it comes to NYCHA, I believe it is absolutely criminal for individuals that stood there while we lied about what's happening when it came to lead. Anyone that lied about lead, anyone that was not standing up for communities, for heat and hot water, I think you need to be held criminally liable. But on top of that, how do we make sure we put money towards the boilers to provide the heat that is necessary? Go into rent stabilization. I believe we should take away J51 tax credits from landlords that are not implementing rent stabilization. Why should New Yorkers not get the help when landlords and developers are getting that help? Equally, when we think about home ownership, how do we address deed theft that's happening in places like Southeast Queens or also a moratorium on third party transfers out in Brooklyn to make sure people can keep their homes and go further and push back against gentrification? The vision we have is mandating creating those opportunities, and I look forward to you learning more. Again, my name is Michael Blake. I'm running for public advocate. Our website is blakefornyc.com, and I look forward to having a great conversation today. Thank you, okay. everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let's uh, jump into it. I'm, we're not going to go up and down the line. I'll invite candidates to um, simply speak up, and we'll make this a conversation as best we can. Uh, our first question, a recent bill introduced in the city council called for the elimination of the public advocate's position, saying that it has run its course. Uh, do you feel the position has run its course as well? Another version of that same question, what is your response to critics who say that the position should be abolished? I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. <clears throat> Look, you know, we just went through a historic midterm cycle, right, where we've seen a record number of women getting elected, women of color. We've seen people demanding that government is, should be more transparent and accountable to those that it serves, right? We've seen just a sea change in the way that people are making demands of those that they elect. So we are, there's a demand for greater accountability and transparency, and that's what this position provides. So here in the city of New York, we should not be thinking about less of that. We should be thinking of how to make it stronger. So there is a, the role that we've outlined our visions, definitely in terms of being a watchdog, being aggressive about legislation, using the bully pulpit aggressively to enact change, as has, has been demonstrated uh, through the office being held by others. So there's role here. What we can do also and talk about is how do we make the position stronger? How do we take it to the next level, right? In terms of looking at the budget of the public advocate's office, not being uh, something that is under, right? The mayor's discretion, for instance, uh, or even the city council's discretion. And in terms of subpoena power, right? And being able to have that authorized and part of the role. And there's a conversation happening right now about charter, the, the revision of the charter, right? Which is the city's uh, constitution of sorts and in figuring out in ways that we can insert that in the conversation that this role similar to the way that the uh, uh, controller is seen as the fiscal auditor right or the fiscal check in terms of how the city runs that this is should be the one position in terms of public advocate that has kind of administrative oversight over all functions of city agencies uh, but we've been outlining right and I mean, if you go to my website mmv.nyc you can la see laid out my platform in terms of things that we will be fighting on but in having the office and the division of research and investigation the division of legal aid these are partnerships that I will involve this office in that is going to augment the role and the reach of the public advocate's office so that it can better represent all New Yorkers. This is a five borough campaign. This is a citywide office. This is about representing the diverse communities across this city. And no, you know, no uh, community is, is uh, similar to the others, right? Everybody has their unique needs and set of priorities. And so we need to make sure that government is responsive to that and that the services the city is providing are responsive too. So that's what this is about. And I do not agree, obviously, with that the role should be eliminated. I, I believe that when we look at the previous for a, a public advocate from Mark Green to Bexy Gapper and to Bill de Blasio to Leticia James, all of them, they did a great job. What I would do when I elect a public advocate 
is to elevate even more the role of the public advocate. I don't think that New York City is leading in many fronts. We still have the most segregated education system in the whole nation. It means that schools in poor neighborhoods are not able to take the children to the level in reading, writing, math, and science when they are in third grade. And I can say because among my, my friends here, I am the only one who used to be a teacher for 13 years and I be a co-founder to a school. I know that Asian community being on the attack because they have a specialized test. So instead of learning from the Asian community and see how they start preparing the kids from since third grade, so when they go to high school, they're really ready. We as a city, all we do is say, we can prepare kids to take the test in eighth grade. That's too late. So I believe that there's many areas. We look at the yellow taxi industry. You know, unfortunately, we have 6,000 individual medallion owner. Many of them committing suicide because the city promised them that they will have the only right to do pick up and drop down the city of New York. And we fail. We fail at the council. We fail at city hall. So I believe that the city of New York need a voice. Need a voice that stand, especially for the working class and for the middle class. Because the upper class, they don't need a public advocate. This is something that is mainly important for the working class New Yorkers. Okay, let me move on. There's, there's um, a question here that I, I want to um, uh, direct, actually, to um, all of you. And keep, this is, this is sort of, uh, it's very political, but it's important for a lot of the media outfits here. This is expected to be a pretty low turnout election. How is that factoring into your campaign strategy? How many voters do you estimate will turn out in this election? And how did you um, arrive at that number? How many people are going to vote? I, there's a political consultant up here, Mr. Michael Blake. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to tell my strategy. But I'm well, it, it's. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not going to say how I think I'm going to win with other candidates here. <laughs> how many people do you think are going to vote? No? Okay. I'll show my numbers. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, we're look. I'm I'm looking anywhere, anywhere between uh, the runoff uh, of 230 something thousand New Yorkers that came out in 2013. Uh, but I'm also factoring the fact that we we've had that we've had a high turnout in the, in the past primary and and general. I think that the New Yorkers are activated. They're, they're people who usually wouldn't vote in local elections, that, but because of what's happening in Washington, are, are feeling that they have a duty here in New York. So I see it somewhere between 200,000 to uh, 600, 700,000. The runoff you're talking about was in 2013 between Letitia James and Daniel Squadron, Correct. right? And that was a runoff for public advocate. Um, okay, that's a, that's a good number. Anybody else? I, I consultants, experts, you guys, making projection that most likely they expect that more than 300,000 people will come out and vote. It is so unfortunately that we don't live in a democratic system where we really persuade people to go out and vote. There's things that we have a lot to celebrate, but we as a society still is, we have one of the nations that we have the lower turnout of people voting for the elected officials. And that's why I even have my bill that will allow immigrants and and, and New Yorkers, we work in permit to vote in municipal election so that we can increase the voter participation. But I would say, based on experts, they say that most likely the expert from 300 to 400,000 people will come and vote in this election. Hopefully, you will help us to increase the number. I think it's interesting also to see how effective the, the new democracy czar is going to be, right? This is probably your first real test <laughs> to, to be able to see what, what they're able to pull off. Yeah, let me know if you if you uh, if you catch her. I've I've spoken with her once, but um, there's no there's no budget for that office, really, right? There's really no staff. Um, l let me um, uh, direct this to Melissa Mark Viverito, and others obviously can comment on it. Question from the audience: Aren't there any better choices than community jails if you want to reform, meaning close Rikers Island? You know, the the, the conversation that. Um I facilitated when we convened the Independent Commission uh, to close Rikers Island to look at it was con was chaired by Chief Judge Jonathan Lipman, who uh, is incredible mind, uh, someone very well respected, and uh, he was able to pull together right a working group that had amongst it people that have been formerly incarcerated, organizations 
that work with those um, who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, academics. It was a very, very robust group, right? Very diverse in terms of, of thinking. But you know, the way that we look at the way that we do our justice system in this country needs to be revised, right? We have all seen people protesting in front of the MDC, talking about the inhumanity, right, of warehousing individuals in these institutional boxes uh, and so that's of concern. That's what's happening at Rikers. That, that is inhumane, what is happening at Rikers. In the summers, no air conditioning. In the stifling heat, talking about the cold, right, at the MDC, no heat or hot water. This is just outdated, the way that we approach it. When we talk about Rikers, two things to understand. One is that the vast majority of the people there are, only, are people that are waiting for their court dates. We have to downsize the population at Rikers. The other percentage, 10 to 15%, are people that have a jail, sent a jail sentence of one year or less. So the idea, one, of downsizing it, that's why we've been implementing a whole bunch of ideas. We need help from the state. Unfortunately, we have not seen some of the reforms that we need to at the state level, right? No leadership from the governor um, who have been able to move some of these issues. But for instance, in downsizing the population and making, creating more justice in the city of New York, we, the criminal uh, summonses, the issue of the Criminal Justice Reform Act, which I spearheaded. Now we've seen criminal summonses down 89% because of that, right? When the commissioner had said that we were gonna go back to the 1970s, we are a safer city, and yet we were able to bring more justice to those people that do not have now a criminal summons and possibly being incarcerated or, or getting a warrant. Um, so downsizing the population is, but, but those that are jailed, right? Or those that are being held, the importance of bringing people closer to their home settings to their networks, to their social networks, their family networks, bringing in a whole host of programs that are gonna help people reintegrate, right, into society in a productive way, creating job opportunities, facilitating housing opportunities, trying to limit, right, the in and interaction with the criminal justice system to begin with because we have a racist system. We have systemic racism that exists. So all of those things are important, but in the meantime, bringing more humanity into the system, looking at it from a holistic point of view, bringing people closer to their home networks, I believe is vital. And it is definitely an approach that is better in the way that we should be conducting justice in the city of New York. And so for those reasons, I convene the Independent Commission and I support um, its findings and its conclusions about closing Rikers and creating a more, more community community-based, holistic approach uh, in terms of how justice is served in the city of New York. So I think this is a very clear difference with what we have in the race. The notion of let's just close Rikers without waiting for the policies that would impact those that are there right now, which can be worked on now that we have a Democratic Senate, specifically speedy trial and bail reform and open discovery, which are fundamental reasons why people are unable to be able to move forward, is something that I think is critical to assess. When referenced around the, the Lippman Commission, Judge Lippman himself said just two weeks ago that the site in Brooklyn would be too large that they're looking at. It's the reason why the site in Manhattan, they pushed back on that within the district because it was not going to work. There has been a lack of community engagement around this approach. Now let's be very clear. We should be building schools, not jails. And the fundamental strategy around criminal justice reform, we have to look at this, yes, holistically, but we also have to be practical in the reality. It is inhumane what is going on at Rikers, no question about that, in which there also has to be transparency. Let's have transparency around the training that's happening for correctional officers. Let's have an understanding of why people are being locked up in the first place and create those dynamics before you go down the road of building many jails across the city. One of the findings in the Lippman report was that there should be a site on all five boroughs, but currently the mayor has a proposal that does not include Staten Island. Yes, the numbers may be smaller, but it does not make sense to be doing this. When you think about equity, currently in the Bronx, which Rikers is a part of the Bronx jurisdiction, you're essentially telling the residents of the Bronx that you have Rikers as a jurisdiction, the barge that is there, Horizon, which was not ready to handle the young people that came in, and oh, by the way, now let's build a new jail on the tow pound of a site that used to be a hospital where there clearly will be health concerns. I think the responsible approach is let's pass the policies now that we have a Democratic Senate. And equally, when mentioned before, that there's not been leadership in the state, the fact that Raise the Age has now been implemented has a dramatic impact on what happens for the population. Let's do speedy trial, let's do bail reform, let's do open discovery. You will then have the real numbers of what do you have to do to then have a more accurate close to home approach. 
That's the kind of strategy we need to be looking at to create a fairness when it comes to criminal justice. What people have been tired in the city of New York is when residents get projects start happening without being consulted. I, as I in 2010, I introduced language to start the process to close Rikers Island. Of course, at that time I was told that the city couldn't do anything because there was not an interest in the city to move in that conversation. I represent Washington Heights, Marble Hill, and Inward, a place where we don't have a large community center, a place where the youth, they don't have coding, they don't have a Chelsea Pier, they don't have anything like that. They don't even have an indoor pool in the whole area. So what people are saying is, if there's anything that we bring to this community, we need to be consulted. And I'm not saying that that community has been picked to build a jail there. So I am for closing Rikers Island since day one when I was elected. But I believe that when the city plans to build jail in community, and the community has not given the input, the community has not given the okay, then it is wrong to move with that plan without the community approval. I, I think I agree with a lot that has been said, so I'm not going to add much. But I, I would say that you know Rikers Island is is uh, a, a very uh, one traumatic experience, especially with the families that go out and, and visit those who are in, in in jail. And more should be done uh, to make sure that they are closer to their homes. More should be done to make sure that those those families who uh, have to go through that traumatic impact of visiting their families in jail should also have access to mental health programs. I have a bill currently in the city council uh, that would allow uh, children who have across to their parents uh, to have access to, to free mental health care. Uh, so I think we should also take that holistic uh, picture and approach uh, to the issue. Um, I'll give you all a chance to uh, possibly hel um, help us with some uh, breaking news. Uh, the mayor is giving his preliminary budget address today. And what I'm seeing on social media, um, un unconfirmed until we know more, but that there's going to be a shortfall, that agencies for the first time are going to be asked to uh, implement a program to eliminate the gap, PEGS for short, uh, which means budget cuts, which would be the first time in five or six years that that's been the case. Uh, there's going to be a reaction from a lot of, of places, and there's going to be a role for the public advocate. Uh, upon hearing this now for the first time, I imagine, well, how do you anticipate uh, stepping into this new era if you should do so as the public advocate? Well. As a council member, I was there getting the briefing from the mayor because that's my responsibility to be informed, to be educated, so that I, you, using that information so that I can be able to engage and influence the process. With the budget that being announced, $92 billion for the 2020, I believe that, as the mayor said, there's going to be probably cut around $900 million. But this is something that, as he will be ready, instruct, instructing the commissioners to put a plan together, we, as a city of New York, as a public advocate, we need to be sure that if by any chance there's any impact happening in the city of New York, it doesn't affect closing firehouse. It doesn't affect cutting after school program. It doesn't affect mainly working class New Yorkers who rely on this. The other thing is also that I always say that, you know, my. My daughter told me she go to the Natural History Museum and she said, you know, when we go to the museum, the visitor gets to see like 20% of everything that the museum has, but there's the other 80% back there that they don't get to be seen. Governments still need to bring more transparency. Even without the major proposal right now, you will get in this budget hundreds of millions of dollars that they will be returned from the agency to city hall because they did not use that money. So I believe that what we need to do is to be sure that as those money will be returned to the 2020 budget, we look at the pot potential cut, and none of those cuts should be affecting uh, underserved community, especially areas related to education and related to immigrant services. I mean, 
I will say for the past few years, uh, you know, the city council and the mayor ha have been working to make sure we're putting set asides in the rainy day fund uh, before we look at uh, making cuts to the most vulnerable communities. Uh, we should see how we can utilize that funding to make sure that that's not the case. Uh, and we should look at, you know, what what is what are the unnecessary expenses that our agencies are are are, are creating now? Uh, how do we look to to make those cuts? Uh, and make sure that you know that the the communities like East New York are not being affected. I mean, the, per the percentage increase in the budget during the de Blasio years went from something like $75 billion up into the $92 billion range, which percentage-wise is a very big increase. Was there, uh, uh, is there any opportunity for second thoughts about that expansion, programs that were overfunded or uh, initiatives that maybe should not have been undertaken? I mean, I would say that there are a lot of initiatives that, that were put into place that, that have failed because of poor management. We saw a lot of tax dollars uh, go, go through the toilet. And we have to, as public advocate, uh, we have to have, uh, we look at, take a deep dive into uh, how the money is being spent. You know, the Fair Fares program, a great program. Uh, we put uh, $500 million into making it happen. And we have to make sure that those dollars are not being wasted and being best utilized um, so, that we, so that we get the most bang from our buck. To, to Arrow's previous question and then tie into this one, uh, a budget shows someone's values. And the assessment that now has to be made is this is not a typical election. Whoever is elected on February 26 becomes public advocate immediately. There's no transition time. You have to determine what do you do within the city, but equally as negotiations are happening upstate while simultaneously figuring out how that impacts the federal impact. Why is that relevant? When you see that there was an announcement by Governor Cuomo and Comptroller DiNapoli saying reductions have come down in terms of revenue for the state, similar impact because of the SALT program, because of the Trump administration, it's all intertwined. And so that means conscious decisions have to be made by what is going on with the agencies. It's one of the reasons to your original question, Errol, about the public advocate role office. It is absolutely essential because you have to have oversight on these agencies. When you see, for example, that yesterday it was communicated for NYCHA that while they initially conveyed that it was less than 2,100 uh, children and apartments that needed to have lead testing, it's actually about 5,800. Why is that relevant to the question? Because then you have to start determining how do we put our priorities in place to help crises happening immediately. Second and finally, though, to the other question that was just raised, public advocate sits on the NYCHA's board. 11 member board that determines what's happening with public pensions. When we think about the financial opportunities, the work we did in working and overseeing minority women owned businesses, we have to ask ourselves, could there be changes in the budget? Could there be better management? Absolutely. That's why you have to have new vision to come on in, to say, let's assess what's going on with the city, let's be responsible, and there absolutely has to be revenue cuts that have to happen. But yes, you can't impact the communities of most need, but you can find ways to increase other revenue. Finally, as an example, you can look at vacant plots of land in New York City build on those plots of land to have revenue that can come in to address what's going on at NYCHA and public transportation and the other public services so that the changes that have to happen with the agencies are not having severe impact on communities of need. You know, when I, when I came into the council, it was eight years of Bloomberg. And during those eight years, there was a lot, a lot of pegs. Every year it was reduction and reduction and cutting of services. It's obviously an incredibly unpleasant reality. The issue back then was also a clash of priorities because you had a mayor, right, who comes from the private sector, business mentality, and really had no understanding, right, and really didn't care to some extent about the important role that social services provide in the city of New York, right? So it was a constant battle. And obviously, whenever there's a conversation of where reductions have to happen, you have to have a serious conversation of what are the priorities. What are those things that are non-negotiable right, for us as a city? And I think the role of the public advocate to be aggressive about really analyzing and studying and even having their own set of hearings as well, right? as the city council has to go through its own budget process, but really engaging communities in a conversation, but taking a look at city agencies, how they're functioning, getting as much access to information as possible to make informed decisions. But it is about reflection of priorities. It is about deciding what are those non-negotiables so that vulnerable communities, the most impacted communities, are not adversely impacted. So those are difficult decisions to make. Uh, but clearly now we're starting to see the effects, the really hurtful effects of this federal administration, which we knew in terms of policies that they would enact were going to come down and trickle down and be hurtful to us at a local level. And we're starting to see the fruition of that, I mean, the, the reality of that. 
Okay, this is a question from um, Max at South Asian Insider Weekly. Uh, do you believe the 25,000 jobs Amazon will bring in adequately offset the $2.5 billion in tax credits and $500 million in construction subsidies? And I'll um, tack on the, the, the hidden question uh, uh, behind all of this, which is what are you going to do about it as public advocate? Amazon deal. So first, no. Uh, it is not enough and it is not at all uh, commensurate because the deal itself that's been proposed says in good faith. There's no guarantees of local hiring. There's no guarantees of minority women-owned businesses. It consistently says there's an out clause that Amazon can leave um, quickly. Secondly, when you think about the numbers that have been proposed, it's a game that the governor and the mayor have been playing. It's the reason why they didn't bring it forth to the legislators on what is happening. They felt very consistently that they thought if they would have come to us transparently, we would not support this deal. The deal is not finalized, Errol, because we're talking about tax credits that have to go through the Empire State Development as well as tax credits consideration here in the city. It's one of the reasons why Senator Norris was just appointed to the committee, which could slow walk and stop this deal. And so at the end of the day, $3 billion should be spent on public transportation and public schools and public subsidies. It should not be spent on building a heliport pad. When we think about the opportunities that are happening as it relates to jobs and the creations, the, the, the data that has been proposed by the governor and the mayor is absolutely inaccurate. For example, it says that there's a nine to one investment when it comes to job creation and wages. That is utterly not true, because that is presuming that the, nothing was coming to that area in the first place. There were small businesses that wanted to be in that area. So we should not at all trust the, the language of these jobs potentially being created, especially, and lastly, when you saw in the testimony on last week where they talked about what would happen with NYCHA residents, where the data said that 30 people would potentially get these jobs, you cannot trust this process. Now, I think it's important for us to be transparent. Several of us, myself included, were all on the initial letter to start a conversation, which is very different to agreeing to the deal absolutely opposed to the deal. Now you'll have others who will say, you should have had foresight, you should think about these things. That's easy to say after the fact. When we talk about how communities of color need jobs and economic opportunities, you have to be responsible in saying, let's start conversations around investment. The current proposal for Amazon is a flawed one and not one that we can move forward on. You know, there's nothing to, to add on to, you know, there, there's nothing that's been presented to the people. There has been, and I, I've been saying this consistently as having, you know, worked with this administration and, and obviously with the governors the same way, is this lack of transparency, right? We're supposed to believe what's being told to us instead of engaging in a serious conversation and process to analyze and discuss this deal. I don't support the deal. Um, again, we have to reevaluate how we do subsidies in this, in this city and in the state. What are we subsidizing? What should we be subsidizing? What are we incentivizing? Uh, and you know, fa real real jobs is critically important, obviously. So right now, what we have is just something on paper that maybe will pan out, maybe not. But they've skirted, right? The deal between the governor and the mayor skir is skirting community review and community engagement. So that could be a serious conversation, and that right there alone does t d uh, that is something that for me is a deal breaker. Absolutely not. Should scratch starts from some scratch and have a different type of conversation of anything. Um, but there's real concerns here, the issue of subsidies overall, how, what are we incentivizing? I think we have to revisit that and reevaluate that. And if we have to change the laws and we have to change the policies in order to do that, we should, we should be really looking aggressively at how do we support our small businesses? Because it is in our immigrant communities and our small businesses that are creating the majority of jobs in the city. And so if anything, we have to figure out how do we streamline to make those businesses, which we hear complaints all the time about how difficult and onerous and the regulations and it's burdensome and the paperwork, we have to figure out how do we support our local uh, businesses as a way of providing and continuing to grow jobs in the city of New York. I, I just feel that the answer is no. The deal as it is presented should not happen. Uh, the tech company, in the United States, they had to do much better. Last year, more than 98,000 people, they were brought from all the country to work in the tech company because we had not been able to build a pipeline. I believe that if the, any tech company wants to come to the city of New York, first, they need to work with the local CUNY colleges. Second, they should really invest on improving our mass transportation. And third, they should be open and transparent on any deal. 
something that it didn't happen. But when it comes to the local small businesses, yeah, those small businesses, especially around the Queens area, they are afraid, and they are, have a lot of concern how they will be destroyed. But I also want to take the opportunity to say, you know, here we not only have to stop Amazon, but also we need to protect the local small businesses. And that's why I let, I have a bill with 30 council members, the Small Business Job Survival Act, that will give the right and the fairness for local small businesses to sign and renew the leases. It will be the only tool that we have. And unfortunately, the speaker here, she did not give even a hearing to the bill. Well, the bill that been introduced in 1987, and all the previous speaker, at least they have been given a, a hearing. That time around, there was not any opportunity, even though we have enough numbers of council members to pass the bill. I, I think, yeah, I didn't answer. I mean, I, I, I would add that, yes, I'm, I'm the only person up here who did not sign the letter asking for Amazon to come to the city. And the reason I did not is because it, it was clear uh, the, the impact that the headquarters in Seattle has had to that city. Uh, the city has become unlivable. Uh, prices of rent have gone up to points where people are being pushed out, neighborhoods being gentrified. The workers of the company are being exploited. Uh, it's a company that does not allow for, for uh, union deals to be broke so that you know, the workers can have uh, further protections. And it, it was easy to see that moving Amazon into New York was only going to bring in more of those problems to a city that w that's already dealing uh, with those problems as it is. You know, how, why can we just take $3 billion and invest them to the small businesses in our city, which are the largest, which is the largest employer uh, uh, of our city, which is responsible for a lot of tourism that we see every day. And we have to make sure that we're making real investments to protect the integrity uh, of our city and inviting corporations with, with massive payouts uh, does not, uh, at the end long run, benefit the city of New York. Okay, we're coming down the home stretch. I know people have some time constraints and I wanted to go to 3.30, but I know uh, we risk losing some folks. So I wanna, uh, let's get some, let's get some uh, quick questions under our belt, because I know there are some things we can uh, respond to briefly. Um, you're, as you said, you're going to serve as a watchdog if elected as public advocate. This is to all of you. Uh, do you know, uh, did, are you aware that city agencies and the office of the mayor do not give enough advertising to community and ethnic media. There's a companion question, which I anticipated. Uh, the city of New York has not done enough for the ethnic media. What will you do for ethnic media as public advocate? Can I start with that? Yes. Let me, let me say, this, is, this has been an ongoing issue. Um, and I believe that at least there was some progress when I was speaker because I did make it an issue and a priority. As I indicated at the beginning, um, I value, right, one of the beauties of our city is its diversity, and I value that, and I have been extremely passionate. I'm one of the most passionate, if not the most passionate advocate in the city of New York on behalf of immigrant communities, uh, and it's, unsurpa it's unsurpassed. Uh, the issue of the importance of ethnic and community media in getting information out there deep into the communities, that is why when I became speaker, I created a division that was specifically focused on ethnic and community media. How do we make ourselves more accessible I had roundtable conversations, roundtable meetings where I invited the community and ethnic media to have conversations with me. I had conference calls making myself completely available. We did outreach into the community ethnic media to make sure that our uh, city council website was more, uh, was more transparent, was easier to access. We made sure that we were having ongoing dialogue. And as a result, we also forced the administration to engage in that conversation. As a result, we did see some additional resources towards advertising, but clearly we haven't gone far enough. Right, and that's what we were talking about, that the city needs to be able to, the agencies, our services, need to be able, right, to be responsive to the reality of our city. Our city changes. Right? I was talking, for instance, to a group of Muslim leaders who were talking about the fact that they would like a senior center right, that is directed and, and more available to their community. As our community grows, our com uh, we have to make sure the services are following suit. So the issue of resources in terms of advertising as a way of effectively making government work for New Yorkers, we have to get information into the diverse media outlets. And that includes ethnic and community media, digital ads as well, 
in those platforms, et cetera. So I worked on that, and as I indicated before, I have on my staff people that are solely dedicated to doing outreach to community and ethnic media because I believe in that so strongly. So that is definitely something that I have experience with. I've acted towards it, and I would continue to advocate very strongly as public advocate because the city of New York belongs to all of us. Right, and we have to make sure that we're doing everything off, uh, possible to make our government as accessible and as open and transparent for every single person. And I don't think, as I said before, I don't think that this city is still ready for the diversity that we represent. Yes, look at the debate we put in together. There's no effort to say you should have black and Latino faces. Turn the TV, four, seven, 11, nine, and it's like the Latino we don't accept in the city of New York when you look to the anchor. And we are 29%. And I think that even though we have seen some progress, but still the diversity is not there. It's not enough to do foreign conversation. Did we see improvement on the local media to have access to get those ads? The answer is no. Because it's still there's like a network that had no allow the local media, especially that are the voices of the Asian, the Latino, the, the, those who came from Africa, those who came from the former Soviet Union, to say those residents have the right, they should be informed. As a public advocate, what I know is to fight and to get results. I did it as an organizer, I did it as a council member, and when I become the public advocate, I will be sure that all those funding that we put to, DO, to DOT, to the Department of Building, to HPD, to the Department of Health, really those funding should be spread equal. In the 1900 census, the New York City population was 96% white, 2% black, Latino were not counting. Today population is 29% Latino, 27% Afro-American, 15% Asian. And it's still today, the media is a typical sample, but that happened everywhere. And it should it sent the message everywhere. We live in a segregated society. And he started on how he invests every single dollars in the local media, they don't get a fair share of investment. So to that question, tomorrow night, for example, El Diario, Amsterdam News, and several others will be uh, co-moderating a, a debate uh, Eleanor Tatum of the Amsterdam News moderating that debate um, in Brooklyn. So to the question around ethnic media, one, there has to be greater engagement. There's no question about that. Uh, we think about the opportunities. On this past Sunday, uh, when I was endorsed by the New American Voters Association out in Queens, we particularly did a South Asian roundtable. Or when we were endorsed by the United African Coalition across the city, how do we engage, and not just in our native languages, but in Spanish and in French, and regardless of the language it may be, there has to be language sensitivity and cultural sensitivity when engaging with ethnic media uh, itself. When thinking about, again, the priorities, this is a change election. You know, we have to ask ourselves, will the persons that have the opportunities to invest in these priorities but did not do enough be the ones that can lead us forward, or do you have a new vision around this? This is personal for me. Uh, I was a journalist before all this. I was an associate producer. My training is in broadcast journalism, and there was an attentiveness of how do you engage with ethnic press and ethnic media. For example, you can't just think about the wording in a daily perspective, because a lot of ethnic media may be weeklies. And so the attentiveness that they may be going to print on a Tuesday to go out on a Thursday, so how do I assess what's happening throughout the week in terms of the narrative of being conveyed. It's that awareness that you have to have to effectively be able to get the communication out. Lastly, when you think about the census that's coming up, when you think about a scenario where because of the federal government and the concerns surrounding the federal government, there is great concern around the outreach and the awareness around it, you have to have someone that's thinking about how do we have an outreach approach. My portfolio when working for President Obama was constituency organizing and outreach. Whether it be from Iowa or going out and helping across the country. I am the validation. Black people go to Iowa. It does happen from time to time. We can make that happen, right? And so in that space, how do you create that strategy? And thinking about in very targeted communities and targeted efforts, especially here in New York, applying that same kind of approach. And so we would bring a constituency roundtable. We've been doing that already. But then lastly, you have to also amplify to make sure that there's funding that's going to these outlets. Too many of these publications are losing readers. They're losing their opportunities because they're not getting funding. So you have to make sure that's a part of the priority. And that goes back to the budget as well. 
This is why diversity is important in leadership. This is why diversity is important within the agencies. I think anyone who grew up in an ethnic household understands that ethnic media is mainstream media in those homes. And if we had people uh, working across the board uh, who, who had that understanding, I, I, I would bet that we would see more investments in, in these ads and making sure you're more engaged in those conversations. Okay, so just to be uh, crystal clear, um, whichever of you becomes the next public advocate, um, you will direct more agency resources, or you'll fight to direct more agency resources to um, uh, do advertising and other joint programs with community and ethnic media. And, and to change the formula on how those money that agency get when they open IFP for publications and for to put any ad should also include the independence of local media, something that is not happening today. Okay. Um, related question, public officials like Andrea Ocasio-Cortez utilize free tools like Instagram to engage a wider audience of young people to vote and stay updated on important issues. How will you use social media to broaden your community outreach once in office? I think my, my, I think my Instagram uh, game is strong uh, from what I hear. A lot of people like following. I think it's important that, that we use social media across the board, whether it be the Instagram stories, whether it be Twitter, whether it be Facebook. Uh, it's important that... Uh, every elected official's office uh, is using those those um, those platforms uh, to get uh, the word out on what what they're working, what their opinions are on certain issues, uh, and it's also a very effective tool uh, in holding uh, the, the mayor and other of the government's body accountable. Uh, there's there's a lot of pressure that you can put on uh, by a simp simply tweeting an opinion and getting others to retweet it, getting others to like it, and it really drives pressure on the issues that matter most to New York. I'm gonna can I, I just have to I'm gonna step away. I'm gonna I have to leave. I, unfortunately, so I apologize. Um, but just very quickly, I mean, look, we have to be able to adapt <laughs> to, the, to what is available and what is effective, right? A lot of people uh, use social media, whether it's Instagram or Twitter or what, whatever the new platform may be right now. So in order to effectively communicate again with government, we have to be open, transparent. We have to allow and explain how government works well, knowing, knowing what services exist, what's available to communities, we need to be able to do that and re reach people where they're at. Right? The problem with government has been that we're always expecting people to come to us. And we're expecting people to figure it out. No, we have to be accountable and transparent to those that we represent. We have to be able to communicate with those that we represent. It's our responsibility to figure out the most effective way and what's the deepest reach that we can get, right? So the idea of using these platforms as a way of doing that is critical. Um, and and, uh, and finding the right ways to do that in government is important too. That's something that we aggressively did when I was in the council, um, again, through, uh, through the division that we created that not only dealt with community ethnic media, but also was aggressively figuring out ways that we can ensure that people know what the city council does. That make act, make our hearings accessible, et cetera. So I would do the same as public advocate, because what we want is to make sure that people know what the public advocate's office is, what it's there to do, um, and that what we and that we want people to help define the work of the public advocate by telling us what their concerns are, and then directing the work of the office through that engagement. So to me, obviously, the use of social media is critical. Um, and I definitely, uh, I do my own Twitter for the most part, not on the campaign trail right now, I do most of it, but I would want to bring uh, some young people, millennials, that are really good at this stuff to figure out how to aggressively be able to get out there to, to, um, to uh, all, all New Yorkers. Thank you for the time, thank you for the invitation. Have a good afternoon. The, 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 there's a necessity, of course, of engaging with social media, but it should not mean that we lose the opportunity of the press uh, and what's happening in the press, especially in this environment of Trump where too many times people are questioning the validity of news of what's being conveyed uh, in the press. So it's a both and approach. You think about how social media can make people aware uh, of the information. You know, this past Sunday and, and, and previous uh, nights as well, when we were out in Brooklyn, at MDC Brooklyn, to be able to tell the story in real time, utilizing social media and to be able to engage in conversations to provide that information, that's valuable or going back to when we utilized Facebook in 2012 to be able to connect to, to unregistered voters and push out to people to get registered and others to be re-registered as well. And so there's obviously impact and value from social media and we're utilizing that, whether that's on Twitter, whether that's on Instagram, whether that's Facebook Live, finding those different mediums. But at the end of the day, that is to drive action and mobilize action. And one thing that has to happen in the public advocate's office is utilizing social media to drive activity. 
it cannot be about a moment, it's how do you mobilize people for a movement. When you think about the women's march from several years ago, it was successful on that day, no question about it. But it's a continued success because for the next 100 days there were 10 actions. So it was utilizing the power of social media to be able to do that. But it cannot lose sight on the impact of the press. Because at the end of the day, while something may be told in real, real time, they won't have the context of all the facts and other information that may be available to provide full nature to the story. And that's why we have to appreciate both. Well, and the social media is part of the press. I remember being chosen, chosen as a protester of the year by the Time Magazine during the Occupy Wall Street. And everything started when, you know, I was there. I was as a chairman of the Higher Education Committee that I, that I was at that time. I went to see what was going on. And when I was arrested, someone put a Twitter that I was arrested. And later on, when I went to the Time a building, the building of the Time a magazine, and the gentleman who was writing the story, he said, I just got to know what happened because someone posted in, the, in the Twitter. So I believe that from the independent media to the larger newspaper, everyone is adapting and making all those changes to be sure that social media is part of the press. What we need to know is also that the underserved, that immigrants also get, are educated and get the tools. Because 10 years ago, having WhatsApp, having Facebook, it was more like the new millennium. It was more the children born and raised here. It was more the, the teenagers, the one that you were using the social media. Today, you get a grandma or a father or whoever who not necessarily even speak the language, English, and they are following the Facebook, they are following the Twitter, they are following the social media. So I think as technology continues being part of our current and future generation, what we need to do to be sure is that no one is left behind as it is happening today. When you look at coding, technology, robotic, it's mainly white boys, the ones that are the largest number. It's a lack of female, and there's a lack of black, Latino, and Asian in those programming. So I hope again that we use, we continue using the social media, but it doesn't replace the largest newspaper or the largest independent newspaper. They are part of the press too. Okay, um, this, this is um, a, a narrow but important question. Uh, Col Claudette Colvin is a living legend. Uh, for those who don't know, Claudette Colvin was one of the first uh, civil rights protesters in Montgomery, Alabama, before Rosa Parks famously refused to leave the segregated section of the bus and got arrested and kicked off that phase of the civil rights movement. Claudette Colvin, who was 15 years old at the time, actually did the same. Uh, she often doesn't uh, get the kind of attention. The movement sort of pushed her to the side, in part because uh, she was an unmarried teenager who um, uh, got pregnant, and so she was not the person they wanted to be the face of the movement. She's getting her due now. She happens to live up in the Bronx. Living legend, a street where she lives, um, in, in a, on the street where she lives, community is working to rename it after her. Would you support the community's appeal to the mayor to sign this? Yes, 100%, it needs to be done. Easily done, easily done. Okay, there you go, do a little business here. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a cap for charter schools in New York State. As public advocate, would you support increasing the cap? No. no. I believe that charter schools are part of the city. However, they should not be as using the space in public school. Okay. Um, and this, this is one that uh, we've, we've seen a lot of activity on. Are you, um, how are you planning to ensure that New York City remains a sanctuary for immigrants? How will you make it clear to ICE that New York protects its immigrants regardless of uh, legal status? Well, first and foremost, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I was the council member that codified uh, New York City as a sanctuary city uh, to make sure that no matter who's in office moving forward, um, that the, the, the protections that immigrants now have uh, from city agencies um, will, will continue to be existing uh, moving forward. Uh, as public advocate, I will travel to Albany. I think that we need to make sure the state is doing the same. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the places where immigrants are most vulnerable are in st you know, state courthouses, in, in, st in, in places where they have to interact, interact with state agencies. And that's the only way we're going to actually uh, create full protections is by making sure that the state of New York passes uh, san sanctuary legislation. This is an area where it is clear 
that we think we have a difference here, where we have to have federal relationships to provide uh, vision. Yes, we have to protect our city to be a sanctuary city, no question about that. But we also have to make sure we're protecting our residents in every possible way, given the attacks that are occurring. For example, when we submitted language and public comment on the public charge rule, which would have a decimating impact on immigrants in, in the city by making someone possibly determine do they keep public assistance or get citizenship. Or when we put forth legislation just two past weeks ago to determine that yes, while a shutdown uh, deal had been agreed to for furloughed employees, individuals that are contractors and security guards and janitors are not getting that back pay. And so it is that attentiveness of making sure the protections are there, but this is one area where I do believe that the work that I have federally, state, and city, as someone who's a co-sponsor of the DREAM Act that just passed, as someone who worked on minority-owned businesses, as someone who's a son of Jamaican immigrants, to say we have to provide these protections, but we have to recognize we are facing an onslaught giving the absolute racist strategy that's coming out of DC. Why is this timely and appropriate? Because when you see that there's a possibility that next week you could have a shutdown again, because of a president that is demanding to try to build an absolutely discriminatory wall, it then creates more awareness of what's happening in the city and the protections that have to happen to New Yorkers. And so we have to make sure that, yes, we got to figure out ways to protect, make sure we stay a sanctuary city and the support that happens there, but we also have to be aware of the other policies that have impact on our immigrants and new Americans that are wondering how to have protection here in New York. Como inmigrante que soy, estoy completamente seguro que vamos a salir de esta crisis siendo una ciudad mucho más fuerte y respetando a los inmigrantes, reconociendo sus colaboraciones. I have no doubt that as a person of faith, we will come from this process stronger than ever. Because it's not only that Donald Trump has been the worst president, it's that he's been speaking for millions of people that they are afraid to say what he's been saying. There's people who believe that they are superior than others. The people who believe that we should have a city in New York, where we call it the city opportunity for everyone, but the quality of education is determined by the zip code where the child is born and raised. We want to call it that we are in the forefront protecting everyone, but we know that there's places in this neighborhood where people have not crossed few blocks to interact with people that don't look like them. So for me, again, as a council member for 10 years, being arrested many times when there was a law against the immigrants in Arizona, a, when Ravis was also arrested and being in the process to be deported in, in, uh, through ICE, I have been there fighting before being elected, after being elected. And it is that experience that will allow me to be the voice of the immigrants, the voice of those 38% born and raised in other countries and the rest of New Yorkers whose grandfather were born here. Because when you think about Ellis Island, you think that only Europeans came from there. 5,000 Dominicans came through Ellis Island in 1887. Juan Rodriguez was brought by the Dutch, a free black man from the island of the Caribbean who became the first non-Native American who settled in New York City. And I was able to get Mayor Bloomberg to sign a street at 181st indictment after Juan Rodriguez. That story has not been told to our students. Our people still believe that when we talk about undocumented, it's Mexican, it's people who look like me. They don't look at someone who is Greek, who is Italian, who is Irish, who are undocumented. And I feel, again, that after this process, working together with a brother from Pakistan, from Afghanistan, the Muslim, the Jewish, the, you know, the, the, the Afro-American, the Latino, we will continue making progress because segregation is not over. Segregation is here today. It's based on opportunity. Opportunity is, you will know that many people are not getting today. And it's happening under our watch. And the media is not reporting. It doesn't make it to the media. But we know. Yes, look at the cultural institution. You know who are doing the law entry job? Black and Latino. You know who are getting the leadership job? Not necessarily the black, Latino, and the Asian. Yes, go to any institution in the city of New York. And I feel that we have that responsibility for my daughters, six and 12, for all these children in the city of New York to be sure that we built the best city where every single one individual should have the same opportunity, including immigrants like me and immigrants of those who the grandfather, grandfather was, the grandfather of Mario Cuomo, the grandfather of the president today. 
I just also want to add and kind of build on what Blake was saying uh, about the need to look beyond, you know, just codifying sanctuary cities in our city and state. Uh, there are laws that um, currently uh, put immigrants at risk to unnecessarily, unnecessarily uh, deal, with, deal with law enforcement. When you look at um, the, the, the effort on my behalf with working with the Donis Rodriguez to legalize e-bikes so that the delivery men do not get pulled over and do not get ticketed. When we look at cre uh, decriminalizing marijuana on the state level uh, to make sure that, that young, young children, especially young immigrant children, are not being caught up uh, with law enforcement. When we look at uh, other states that actually have a law that allows for undocumented to get a driver's license, you know, New York City, New York State should be part of that conversation as well. And those are the issues that I will continue advocating on as public advocate. Errol, if you don't mind, a few seconds. Yes. I'm looking to vote in the next few days the resolution the city of New York supporting to provide the state of New York to provide licenses to documented New Yorkers. That's a bill that I have at the council. That's a bill that, that I reintroduced, and I'm working with the speaker and the advocate to pass that resolution in the next few days. I also have a bill, the council, the immigrant voting rights that will allow New Yorkers with green card and working permits to vote to reestablish the rights because people used to have in the past for individuals who are green card holder and working permits holder to elect the local elected official from the mayor, the controller, the public advocate, and the council member. It doesn't make sense. We're talking about non-taxation without representation, and there's 100,000 of people paying the taxes, and they cannot elect who are the local leaders, and we have the right to do it. And I have a bill with, 30, with a number of council members, and I'm looking to get the support with many advocates to pass the bill. Okay, we're coming down the home stretch here. I want to give you each a minute to um, give some final words to these members of the community and ethnic media. They're going to all uh, go out and um, publish and broadcast and editorialize and maybe even endorse in the next couple of weeks uh, in the run up uh, to the election. So we'll uh, let you go in whatever order you'd like. You know, as, as a son of immigrants, uh, I definitely understand the importance of ethnic media. Uh, as a council member and a state assembly member, I, I made sure uh, that I worked uh, with El Diario and all the, all the other Spanish newspapers to make sure that my constituency understands what's happening uh, locally in their districts. I also represent a heavily populated uh, Bengali Muslim community uh, that depends on papers like Bangla Patrika, who I worked with, work with on, on a daily basis to make sure that the, that the Bengali community understands what city government is doing for them as well. Uh, you know, and I'm running for public advocate because as, as a New Yorker, uh, as a son of immigrants, I'm concerned about the direction our city is headed. You know, it's getting more expensive to live here. Our infrastructure continues to fall apart. Uh, they, we need real action uh, to, to make real reforms. We have elected officials using the same old playbook to deal with the same old problems, and we're seeing no real results. Uh, as, a, as a young legislator, I've proven to be a creative legislator and worked on issues that government has been afraid to take on. When I talked about e-bikes, it's an issue I've been talking for seven years since I first got into office. And what has happened, because of the delay on that issue, thousands and thousands of immigrants have to interact with law enforcement and pay hefty fines, uh, he fines that has put their families and the livelihood in jeopardy here in, our, in New York City. So I will continue fighting, I'll continue legislating, and as public advocate, I'll be a representative for all New Yorkers. I'm the son of Jamaican immigrants. My full name is Michael Alexander Blake. I'm named after Michael Manley and Alexander Bustamante. I come to you as someone who represents the most diverse district and county in America according to the census. In the Bronx, 89.7% likelihood that any two people you meet be a different ethnicity. Largest West African population in the world outside of West Africa. Chair out here dropping because they like my answer, right? <laughs> it's the attentiveness of the experience of this moment of how do we help the people. I believe the trains and buses should run on time because too often communities are wondering how they can get back to their homes and their families faster. I believe in a vision that we should be building schools, not jails. I believe in a vision that we should be tracking the jobs that are created for people of color, small, minority, women-owned businesses, but also making sure we know the jobs, not just the contracts, but the jobs that are being created. I believe we have to focus on cultural sensitivity when it comes to education and making sure we have an awareness with halal food being in schools. It's the awareness of our protection of our drivers and our workers in all different communities. 
It's the understanding that we have to have a broader conversation on specialized high schools by making sure that we say to the Asian community, we hear you and respect you, while equally saying that the black and Latino community is asking for great opportunity as well. We can all win together. And so I am asking for those that are making endorsements to consider endorsing our campaign. I'm asking for all those that are here that you hear the vision of what we're trying to create to help the city. We need a public advocate that's thinking and fighting for everyone. Again, my name is Michael Blake. I'm running on jobs and justice for the people. Our party name is for the people because that is the representative vision that we have. If you wish to learn more, again, BlakeForNYC.com, and I look forward to being in the build with you moving forward on this critical election on February 26th. And to all the media in the room, we say thank you because we understand that you have been under continual assault, whether if you're a constituent ethnic press or the broader dynamics of the freedom of press that's being attacked by President Trump, you are valued, you are appreciated, and we say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. You get what you see from me. A immigrants with accents, but as a strong as my accent, it is my commitment and my experience to hold the office of the public advocate. Someone that is ready to fight the special interest, someone that will bring independent voice, standing for working class and middle class. Someone that has been fed all entire, many as many New Yorkers, to see that when someone called 311, if that phone call was made from a sea code where upper class individual live, there's an immediate response. There's an immediate solution. But if you live at 18 Jacobo's place, such as where I used to live with my daughter when she was two years old, and making on the phone call because there was no heat at two in the morning, and time passed, three weeks after inspector come at 10 in the morning, and the question was, do you have heat now? And if the answer is yes, they don't follow up. That's the experience of most New Yorkers. 40% New Yorkers who live in poverty. I have accomplished a lot of in big things before being elected, after being elected. My fingerprints is there on the Fair Fair campaign. My fingerprints is there fighting to improve public transportation in the city of New York. But my fingerprints is there working with a student for 13 years, which is the only access that we have to take our children to be middle class. I believe in a city of New York where working class will live in dignity, with a path to take the children of the middle class, the children of the working class, to be middle class. I'm ready to hold this job from the first day after being elected on February 26th with the support, with your support and the support of your reader. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, candidates. That brings us uh, to the end of our time. A uh, final reminder, the election is on the 26th. That's 19 days from now. And uh, I think the candidates will be here for just a second if you want to gr grab them for some last questions or arrange other interviews. And I want to uh, thank the Center for Community and Ethnic Media for getting this done on relatively short notice and getting uh, an important candidate uh, forum uh, to the people who need to see it the most. Thanks very much.